Oh, okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming to the second of our Irish Studies uh, seminars for this semester. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker for this afternoon, uh, who is uh, Ken Dawson. Uh, Ken is graduate of, of Queen's um, and is, uh, well, for a long time, head of history and politics at Down High School in Down Patrick. Um, uh, before being appointed vice principal of Dyer High in 2008. Uh, in addition to his many teaching and uh, administrative responsibilities, he's also a very active researcher. He's been working on the history of the United Irishman uh, in, uh, in Ulster for, for many years and specialising in particular uh, on um, Samuel Nielsen. And he's just published uh, in, in the last few months uh, with Irish Academic Press Belfast Jacobin, or the Belfast Jacobin. Samuel Nielsen and the United Irishman. Um, and if you get a few copies here, so if anyone doesn't have a copy already, uh, can we'll be very happy to, to pass one on to you later on uh, this afternoon. But what he's going to talk to us about this afternoon uh, is Samuel Nielsen. Uh, so his paper, as you can see, is at the head of the conspirators, Samuel Nielsen and Radical Belfast. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Peter, for that introduction uh, and for the invitation to speak here uh, this afternoon. Uh, and walking down, um, having eventually found a parking space, it brought me back to my days at Queen's in the late 1980s. Um, great memories of uh, extended lunches at the Great Hall and the speakeasy on a Friday afternoon. I suspect some traditions never change. Uh, the freezing cold ninth and tenth floors of the old library. Uh, the euphemistically named coffee lounge on the ground floor of that library with a vending machine and plastic cups. Um, and perhaps my fondest memory from Queen's uh, was uh, being taught by Dr. Peter Jupp, later Professor uh, Pete Jupp, uh, and his excellence uh, as a teacher, but also as a gentleman. I always felt that um, Professor Jupp looked out for me, uh, but when I, um, when I talked to other people who were at Queen's at the time, I think that he did that for just about everybody um, that he taught. Uh, such, was, uh, such was the nature of the man. Peter's already mentioned the fact that I, I'm a teacher uh, in Downpatrick and uh, I, I know that I'm coming here as much as an enthusiastic amateur uh, as anything else. But I have been working for a number of years on um, Samuel Nielsen, uh, perhaps um, not as well known as perhaps he deserves to be. And what was his attraction? Um, well, he's not a stranger to the published material on the United Irishman uh, but he does not have the reputation of a Theobald Wolf Tone, a Lord Edward Fitzgerald, or locally, a Henry John McCracken. I think Thomas Pakenham, in his um, book on the 1798 rebellion published in the 1960s, did Nielsen as a disservice, as something of a shambling drunkard. Um, more recent work by people like Thomas Bartlett, Marianne Elliott, Jim Smith, Kevin Whelan, Nancy Curtin, has, I think, emphasised Samuel Nielsen as a figure of some importance. Um, he doesn't have a comprehensive archive. Um, he was neither prone to uh, historical self-promotion or great speeches. But despite this, his role and legacy is, in my view, well worth exploring. The notorious informer William Byrd was an Englishman who appeared in Belfast in the middle of the 1790s, became part of the town's radical set, and then betrayed his erstwhile friends in pursuit of financial reward. In late 1796, after the authorities had arrested some of the most senior United Irishmen from the town, Bird, who went by the rather absurd alias of John Smith, gave his judgment on the incarcerated men. Samuel Kennedy, the compositor of the radical Northern Star Press, was, and I quote, a coxcomb whose impudence and vanity is matchless. His natural talents are small. Kennedy was said by Bird to be likely to turn informer if kept in solitary confinement. <coughs> the publican, John Young, it was said, would eventually crack if separated for a long time from his wife, the love of his life. The aforesaid Mrs Young, however, had a mind of her own and had already by that stage made a cuckold of John Young. Roly Osborne, a shadowy figure with a knowledge of military matters, was, in Bird's description, a man of the first rank as a Republican of the North. Daniel Shanahan, a legal clerk and one of the few Catholics at the centre of the United Irish Conspiracy in Belfast, 
was regarded as something of a political fanatic who would suffer death rather than betray his colleagues. He did, however, in Bird's words, cower from the fury of his wife. And all of these figures are relatively lesser known figures in the radical coterie in Belfast at that particular time. Of Samuel Nielsen, the prosperous merchant and editor of the radical Northern Star newspaper, Bird wrote that he was a Presbyterian, and I quote, of the most rigid caste, a great effector of consequence, gloomy and pedantic. He is at the head of the conspirators, knows everything, but I am pretty certain he'll suffer death rather than tell. In the Belfast Jacobin, I argue that Nielsen, this often forgotten figure, is in many respects the key that unlocks the door to our understanding of the United Irishmen in Belfast and Ulster. As one of the key founders of the Society of United Irishmen in October 1791, Nielsen would direct radical public opinion through his editorship of the Northern Star newspaper. And when the project gained a new urgency in the middle of the decade, it was Nielsen, alongside Thomas Russell and Henry John McCracken, who would prepare Ulster for an indigenous rising with French assistance, militarizing the movement and conducting the delicate relations between the United Irishmen and their potential Catholic defender allies. Arrested in September 1796, he was confined in Dublin's newly opened Kilmainham jail, from where he continued to direct events, both in Ulster and in Dublin. Released in February of 1798 and in poor health, he worked alongside the radical uh, and rebel commander-in-chief, Lord Edward Fitzgerald, in finalising the plans for an insurrection, with or without the French. Imprisoned again and denied entry to the United States, imagine the United States of America blocking immigrants from troubled parts of the world, he was one of the state prisoners dispatched to Fort George in Inverness in 1799. When Nielsen was eventually freed in 1802, he did finally gain access to the US and was contemplating the establishment of a newspaper in New York when he was taken ill. Seeking solace from the rampant yellow fever in the metropolis, he took a boat, a, a boat up the Hudson River, but was taken off at Poughkeepsie in New York State, where he died on the 29th of August, 1803, isolated from his family and friends. The anonymity of Nielsen's passing and the fact that he did not achieve immortality either on the scaffold or through the effects of a poorly wielded penknife makes Nielsen an understated figure in the momentous decade of the United Irishman. Someone who sits not at the top table of Irish patriots, but with the first cousins. At the feast, but not quite the centre of attention. My intention was to acknowledge what the primary sources showed to be Nielsen's considerable role as founder, editor, conspirator and orchestrator of the United Irish Project. My purpose was not to write a hagiography. Irish history, both written and visual, unionist and nationalist, has created too many martyrs and villains. Nor does the Belfast Jacobin try to instruct us for the future, but in a nod to the Rankian tradition, it is simply an attempt to show the past as it really was. What does become clear, though, from an assault on the primary sources on this island and in England and Scotland is that much of the Ulster dimension to the 1790s has still to be written. So who was Samuel Nielsen and what was the importance of Belfast to the developing radicalism of the time? Well, the fourth minister of the Presbyterian congregation at Ballyroney, close to Rathfryland in County Down, was the Reverend Alexander Nielsen who was originally from Randallstown in County Antrim. In 1751, he married the 21-year-old Agnes Carson, a widow with a young daughter, Mary, from a previous marriage to one William Finlay. The couple would have 13 children, nine of whom would survive into adulthood. Four of the Reverend Nielsen's sons, John, Samuel, Alexander and Thomas, would move to Belfast, and each of them made significant contributions to the commercial life of the time. 
By the end of the 18th century, Belfast was a bustling port, benefiting greatly from the increase in trade and manufacturing that had been a consequence of the slow liberalisation of Ireland's commercial relationship with England. The pages of the Belfast newsletter from the time reveal a vast array of trades and occupations, but it was the capacity to import and export a range of desirable items that contributed most to the creation of a prosperous town that was both modern in outlook and capable of sustaining a prosperous merchant class. Belfast had received its charter in 1613 and was, of course, the political preserve of the Chichester family. Colonel Arthur Chichester, having been created the first Earl of Donegal in 1647 during the fateful reign of Charles I. As it was a parliamentary borough, the landlord was able to secure the election of two members of the Irish Parliament by virtue of the town sovereign and 12 burgesses, the latter appointed for life. The extent of Belfast's population growth was measured by the town's high constable, Robert Hindman. By 1791, 18,000 people lived in this busy port at the entrance to Belfast Lock. An additional 1,200 people resided at Ballamacarrot, an adjunct to the town on the far side of the River Ligon. The growth of Belfast was managed by the establishment of a pretty remarkable civic culture for a town of this size, dominated by the input of its respectable middle-class citizens. The poor house was opened in 1774 to give relief to the destitute and tackle the concomitant problems of begging and alcoholism. A banking enterprise was created and in 1783 a chamber of commerce formed by a number of the town's most reputable businessmen, among them William Tennant, later a leading United Irishman. A public subscription for the erection of a white linen hall to consolidate Belfast's position at the centre of Ulster's cloth trade raised the impressive amount of £17,750, and Samuel's brother John Nielsen's business contributed significantly to this. The focus of commercial and recreational life was the Belfast Exchange. Built in 1769 at the four corners of what are now Waring Street, Bridge Street, Rosemary Street and North Street, with the added assembly rooms becoming a venue for many important political meetings and cultural events. The, arriving, the arrival in Belfast of the Nielsens coincided with the beginning of an exciting era in Irish politics. The outbreak of the American War in 1775 caused some debate amongst Irishmen, especially in Ulster, from where thousands emigrated in order to avail of the opportunities of life offered in the New World. While there was a considerable sympathy for the grievances of the Americans and their struggle against the injustices of British rule, the exodus of much of the garrison in Ireland was of more immediate concern, due to the age-old fears of invasion by one of England's traditional enemies, such as France or Spain, both of which had become involved in the war by 1778. As it had done in the past, a spirit of civic duty and service came to the fore and, led by prominent Protestant personalities, volunteer companies were formed across the island. The first volunteer unit was formed in Belfast, with the initial muster of the first Belfast volunteer company on St Patrick's Day, 1778. A second unit, the Belfast Volunteer Company, was established shortly afterwards. The volunteers who um, gathered regularly and drilled in the manner of the English army were prepared to rally to the cause in the event of an invasion as well as undertake the functions of peacekeeping civilian defence body. The competence of the volunteers in repelling hostile forces was never to be tested but regular meetings occurred often followed by dinners, numerous toasts and political discussions during which the grievances of many Irishmen, both within and without Dublin's College Green Parliament, were aired. Calls for the reform of an Irish Parliament dominated by an Anglican elite had been made for some time, with the development of a colonial nationalist tradition that was articulated best by intellectuals such as Dean Jonathan Swift. Moreover, the Dublin Parliament's subservience to Westminster became a significant grievance for a patriot tradition that, for much of the century, was possessed more of a whisper than a voice. In Presbyterian Belfast, the lack of Presbyterian, uh, sorry, the lack of effective representation was a source for frustration 
for the town's Presbyterians, many of whom were the merchants who had helped to put the port on the map. So with a new political lexicon flowing from the new world, the Patriots in Parliament aired the concerns about Ireland's political and economic subservience and found perfect, well, almost perfect allies in the ranks of the volunteers, with companies across Ireland, and especially in Ulster, falling in behind the political leadership of Grattan and Flood in the Commons and Charlemont in the Lords. With the end of the war and the granting of a measure of reform, the Patriots and volunteers retired briefly to the side of the stage, with the question of Catholic rights too hot to handle at that stage, especially amongst Presbyterians for whom doctrine overcame political expedience. By the middle of the 1790s then, Samuel Nielsen was on his way to becoming a prosperous businessman, working alongside his brother John to build up the family business, the Irish Woolen Warehouse. That was in Waring Street. John and Samuel had joined the volunteers and the business helped to equip local regiments with their fine uniforms. But John's untimely death in July of 1787 was a significant setback. Nielsen took over the running of the firm and this was successful until, that is, his political activities took centre stage. The outbreak of the French Revolution in 1789 was an event of seismic proportions and its effects were not just held, uh, sorry, were not just felt in Paris. The calls for liberty, equality and brotherhood resonated across Europe and Ireland, of course, was no exception. In Belfast, Presbyterian enthusiasm for all things French was promoted further by the fact that the Catholic Church in France was one of the biggest losers in the revolution. The confiscation of church lands, the assault upon the structure of the Catholic hierarchy and the undermining of any spiritual justification for inequality generated a huge amount of interest, particularly in Ulster. If the Catholic Church was the victim, the revolution was seen as a positive and could even provide a template for political change in Ireland, releasing the sectarian stalemate that had ground the reform movement to a halt a number of years before. In the summer of 1791, Theobald Wolfe Tone's influential pamphlet, An Argument on Behalf of the Catholics in Ireland, articulated clearly what many Ulster Presbyterians wanted to hear, that Irish Catholics, with the potential to abandon the dictatorial aspects of their faith, could become allies in the cause of reform. Samuel Nielsen, an elder in the Third Belfast Presbyterian Church, which was an Orthodox rather than a New Light congregation, was influential in reawakening the volunteer tradition. And he, like many others, marched enthusiastically through the town on both the second and third anniversaries of the fall of the Bastille. In fact, in 1791, he was leading a steering committee of the most radical Belfast volunteers, whose proposals were deliberately kept secret because they called not only for a reform of Parliament, but also for a united approach to politics that was not categorised in traditional sectarian ways. Rather, Catholic, Protestant and dissenter would work together in the interests of representation and good government. So this was the environment into which Tone, informed by his great friend Thomas Russell, who had been posted to Belfast the previous year as an ensign in the 64th Regiment of Foot, ventured during the autumn of 1791. Already the plans for a new political club had been established, as had those for a newspaper that would promote the progressive ideas promoted by Tom Paine and other proponents of political innovation. Nielsen's secret committee was the Society of United Irishmen in embryo. Of course, the roots of the society can be traced back to the political commentaries of the Belfast-born medical practitioner William Drennan, by the stage living in Dublin. Drennan's idea for a reform club, based on the secrecy of Freemasonry, was first mooted back in 1784. He returned to his theme in 1791 and wrote excitedly to his brother-in-law in Belfast, Samuel Mateer, that such a society, if established in Belfast, would soon be formed in Dublin. One less quoted extract uh, from Drennan's letter north was to mention that Drennan had been visited earlier that day in Dublin by 
a man from Belfast called Samuel Nielsen. This was before the doctor put pen to paper. Drennan's letter to McTeer was no coincidence. Only later would the formation of this new club, the Society of United Irishmen, be regarded as significant. Tone was at its first meeting. It was Tone who wrote its resolutions and gave the society its name. But Nielsen was the main man, whom Tone referred to as the Jacobin, and with whom Tone dined before the two men set out for the Crown Tavern off Ann Street, the scene of the first formal meeting. Critical to the development of Belfast as the cradle of political radicalism at this time was the establishment of a second newspaper in the town, the Northern Star. The other paper, Henry Joy's Belfast Newsletter, was certainly progressive enough at this time, being aligned to the cautious Whig interest. However, the conservatism of many Northern Presbyterians, such as Joy, towards the Catholic question suggested that a more strident mouthpiece for the developing reform movement was required. Nielsen and other leading volunteers canvassed opinion in the late summer of 1791, writing out to the great and the good across the province of Ulster to see what the, prevent the potential market was for a new paper. By Christmas, Nielsen, who would become the leading shareholder and editor of the Star, was cheekily advertising the new newspaper in the newsletter, and the prospectus for the new venture would appeal for support on grounds of spirit, impartiality and independence. The Northern Star was first published in January of 1792, and it would soon eclipse its rival, achieving a subscription of over 4,000, plus those who listened to public readings at various locations across Ulster and beyond. Nielsen's editorials celebrated French victories in the Continental War, lambasted the aristocracy for, and I quote, its idle gratifications and despicable pursuits when the hereditary legislators of a country show no respect for public opinion. And the paper enunciated political reform that was fully aligned with the United Irishmen's agenda, which called for a fundamental reform of the Irish Parliament, its functions and its membership. Now, the importance of Nielsen's newspaper as an agent of political socialisation cannot be underlined enough. It represented political education in a truly remarkable form, proving transformational in terms of political engagement and controversial in that no one in authority was safe from the star's criticism and ridicule. The trajectory of the United Irishmen would alter as the 1790s progressed. The outbreak of war between Britain and France in early 1793 prompted Westminster to promote self-interested concessions to Catholics that fell short of what many were demanding. The volunteers were suppressed and political conventions banned. Belfast was ransacked by the military and when the United Irishmen's offices in Dublin were raided in May of 1794, the society was outlawed. In response, the United Irishmen became a more clandestine organisation, which actively explored the possibility of seeking French assistance in a nationwide conspiracy. <laughs> With the possibility of concessions removed by the recall of the reform-minded Viceroy Earl Fitzwilliam in early 1795, a reconstituted society was gearing itself for direct action. Having been implicated in a treacherous plot centred on the French government agent, the Reverend William Jackson, Tone left Ireland for America in June of 1795, although the plan was, of course, that he would embark on a mission to persuade the French Directory to throw its weight behind a project that would distract its enemy from the Continental War and open the potential for a French outpost that could lead to the encirclement of Britain. Now, just before his departure... Tone, Nielsen, Russell and others ascended the cave hill overlooking Belfast and pledged famously never to desist in their efforts until the yoke of England had been removed. So while Tone was working the French axis in Paris, Nielsen became the chief organiser of United Irish preparations. And while his military experience was confined to the manoeuvres of the volunteers, he went about his work with gusto. Using the Northern Star to highlight the excesses of his enemies, 
Nielsen was a leading player in the cultivation of links between the United Irishmen and the defenders. A delicate process that never quite succeeded, such were the suspicions that existed between Northern Presbyterians and the Catholics, whose antipathy was directed at Protestant settlers as much as it was at English governmental control. The use of Masonic lodges as a means to meet clandestinely without fear of infiltration became part of the plan, as United Irish emissaries traversed the province looking to deliver the message of insurrection and the prospect of French assistance. The arming of the United Irishmen, meanwhile, continued apace, with trees being cut down to create pie candles, blacksmiths moonlighting as arms manufacturers, and United Irish societies grafting military ranks onto their existing structures. The newly established military camp at Blairis Moor near Lisburn became critical to the United Irish strategy. To win over the Catholic militia men in the camp would deliver thousands of armed Irishmen to the cause of freedom and rebellion and enable the rebels to advance simultaneously on Belfast, Down, Antrim and Armagh. This strategy, the importance of Blairis, might help to explain why Samuel Nielsen joined Masonic Lodge 193 in Lisbon, in close proximity to the encampment, alongside the leading defender, Bartholomew Teeling, from Pole Glass. And it might also explain why leading Belfast radicals would visit the troops at Blairis on a regular basis, distributing pamphlets and money in the hope of gathering support. The increasing radicalism of the United Irishmen and the Northern Star, unbowed by two legal cases brought against it in 1794, made Nielsen's continuing liberty a genuine danger. And he, along with Thomas Russell and a number of other leading United Irish figures in Belfast, such as Henry Hazlitt, was arrested in September 1796 at a time when a series of murders in the town eliminated a number of government informers who had been deployed to infiltrate and weaken the conspiracy. Evidence in the archives in Belfast and Dublin would suggest that Henry Joy McCracken was heavily implicated in these killings, which were at variance with the assertion by leading members of the United Irishmen that assassination was not part of the movement's modus operandi. Nielsen's arrest did not extinguish the threat, and when Tone's persuasiveness led to the dispatch of a French fleet to Ireland in December of 1796, the security of the state seemed to be in imminent danger, prompting a legal and military assault on Ulster in 1797, which effectively neutered the conspiracy in the north, allowing Leinster and Dublin to become the new epicentre of revolutionary activity. As a prisoner in Kilmainham, and with habeas corpus suspended, Nielsen received visitors and dispensed advice on how the conspiracy should proceed. Falling prone to ill health, he somehow managed to uh, secure the liberty to take fresh air in the evenings, abusing this privilege to interact with his co-conspirators. Released in 1798 on grounds of his physical weakness, uh, Nielsen again threw himself into revolutionary activity, despite his promise not to do so. And he worked alongside Lord Edward Fitzgerald, the Commander-in-Chief of the United Irishmen. The movement, of course, by this stage had been deprived of its more moderate leadership after the arrests in Dublin in March of 1798. And so Fitzgerald and Nielsen would be prepared to unleash a rebellion with or without French assistance. Nielsen, Fitzgerald and the rest of the entourage rode for miles to enlist support for a rising, and the government became increasingly anxious. Now, the arrest of Lord Edward Fitzgerald in May of 1798 is, of course, the stuff of legend, and Nielsen's actions on that day have often been debated. He was, by this time, a physical shadow of his former self, prone to um, health weaknesses and the attraction of the bottle. It was even suggested and this appeared in Thomas Moore's uh, biography of Lord Edward Fitzgerald in the 1830s. It was even suggested that he facilitated by accident or design Fitzgerald's capture at the safe house of Nicholas Murphy on the quays alongside the Liffey. This was later, of course, shown to be false when the true betrayer of the aristocratic rebel chief was revealed as Francis Magan, a barrister 
member of the United Irish Executive and government spy. In the wake of Fitzgerald's arrest in May of 1798, for four days, Nielsen was the main organiser of the Rising. It was Nielsen's idea to signal its outbreak by the burning of the mail coaches from Dublin. But he was never likely to succeed and he was arrested, perhaps drunk, outside Newgate Jail on the 23rd of May, the day the Rising broke out, as he reconnoitred the prison with an eye to springing the dying Fitzgerald and Thomas Russell. The Rising was a bloodbath, a far cry from the lofty idealism of 1791. Protestant, Catholic and dissenter did indeed take to the field, but this was most notably on the government side as Orange Yeoman, Catholic militia and frightened Northern Presbyterians, an area where the sectarian geography was mixed, places like County Armagh for example, combined to defeat the rebels at various points. Atrocities committed by both sides, including massacres of Protestants at Scullabog and Weckford Bridge, was suggestive of a civil war. Tone himself would later admit that things had not turned out as planned. In Wexford, Antrim, Down and in the West, where the landing of Umber's forces introduced the most disciplined and effective military machine on the island during 1798, the revolutionary episode would finally grind to a halt. Imprisoned again, this time in Newgate in Dublin, Nielsen, alongside many of the organisation's leaders, um, had been incarcerated before the rising had begun in earnest. And it was Nielsen, in fact, who played the lead role in brokering a deal between the government and the United Irish leadership, whereby key figures in the movement would reveal the entirety of the conspiracy without implicating any specific individual. That would be in return for their release from prison and exile to any country not at war with Britain. Nielsen took great pride in this deal, the so-called Kilmainham Treaty, the Kilmainham Pact, and he later published a pamphlet from the United States outlining his own motives and revealing episodes of bad faith, as he saw it, on the part of the government in Dublin, although many felt that Nielsen's self-interest was indeed at stake. And it did take some time for all of the state prisoners in the three prisons, the Bridewell, Newgate and Kilmainham, to come on board with Nielsen's plan. While evidence against dozens of state prisoners would be difficult to obtain because of the reluctance of informers to take the stand, Nielsen could have been tried, convicted and hanged. Despite the deal, the continuing war and the staggeringly disappointed news that the American government of John Adams was refusing access to the Irish prisoners, citing their so-called dangerous delinquency, the state prisoners remained in Dublin jails. To remove the threat, the administration in London and Dublin Castle resolved to send the men to Fort George. Fort George military base, uh, as many of you will know, was constructed in the Scottish Highlands in the aftermath of the Jacobite defeat at Culloden Moor in 1746. During the tortuous sea journey to Fort George, um, from Dublin to Gourock via Belfast, Nielsen was perilously ill, delirious and violent. There were even concerns that he would not survive the voyage. Thankfully, Fort George provided a degree of respite from the damp and dark conditions of places like Newgate and Kilmainham. The Lieutenant Governor of the fort, Colonel James Stewart, presided over a fairly benevolent prison regime where the prisoners were allowed to walk in the battlements, swim in the Moray Firth, dine on venison, beef, salmon and lobster, enjoy a generous allowance of wine, ale and port and reside in single rooms with fireplaces and glazed windows, a far cry from the dampness of Newgate. The family of another state prisoner, Thomas Addis Emmett, was eventually permitted to live in the fortress, so too the family of the ill Roger O'Connor. Nielsen's young son, William Bryson Nielsen, was allowed to join his father and enjoyed a pretty remarkable education in mathematics, history, theology, Latin and science. This is a young, young guy of seven years of age. Delivered by the other prisoners, men of significant ability, intelligence and experience. <coughs> 
But not all was rosy in the Fort George Garden. There was talk of further conspiracies, and the prisoners themselves often fell out, living in such close proximity to each other. The Dubliner, Edward Hudson, ceased to interact with the solicitor, William Dowdle. While the toxic relations between Arthur O'Connor and Thomas Addisemmet saw the latter send out a request for duelling pistols to be sent to the fort. Nielsen and Thomas Russell were accused by one of the other prisoners, the Belfast shipbroker Robert Hunter, of being involved in a continuing plot involving the insubordination of Scottish fencibles. Not a wholly unlikely scenario, since Nielsen had forged links with Scottish political societies during the middle of the 1790s, and had met with, among others, the famous radical Thomas Muir, when Muir had visited Belfast. The Fort George prisoners were allowed to receive visitors. It has even been suggested that Robert Emmett was one of them, and this allowed letters to be secreted in and out of the fortress, bypassing the official protocol for correspondence. In 1799, when the debate on a political <coughs> union between Britain and Ireland was being followed by interested parties on all sides, Nielsen wrote from Fort George to his wife Anne that he would welcome such a change, arguing that such a measure would be good for the economies of both <coughs> islands, citing Scotland as a, as a model. The great historian of the United Irishmen, Richard Robert Madden, rejected the likelihood of this claim, the claim that Nielsen was, in fact, an advocate of political union. <coughs> Believing that Nielsen had only said this in order to allow his letter to be forwarded to Belfast. However, what if this letter did not go through the official channels? What Madden failed to publish was a second letter to Anne, a letter which can be found in the University of Rhode Island, uh, University of Rhode Island Library in papers deposited by one of Nielsen's descendants, which reaffirmed his support for the Union. And when one thinks about it, Nielsen's position in 1799 was almost understandable. If the Union Bill failed, an Irish ascendancy would continue to misgovern. And in his second letter, Nielsen reeled against the orange interest that would inevitably prop up the ascendancy regime. At this stage, before the intervention of the Lord Chancellor Fitzgibbon, it was thought that the Union would deliver Catholic emancipation, something that would not be considered if Union were to be defeated. That the Union was passed without emancipation in 1800 was not a detail that Nielsen would have been privy to at the time of his writing. Eventually then, at the end of June 1802, um, during a brief and uneasy truce between Britain and France, the prisoners were permitted to leave Fort George. The men disembarked in the free city of Hamburg before going their separate ways. Despite the fact that they were forbidden to return to Ireland, Nielsen had made arrangements for a secret visit home prior to his departure for the United States. <coughs> his journey was risky, but it was worth it. And when he was in Ireland, he did meet up with some of uh, his radical co-conspirators from the 1790s. People like Charles O'Hara, uh, people like James Hope, Jemmy Hope from Temple Patrick in County Antrim. His journey back to Ireland was to see his wife and family. Um, I think it was also to clear any suspicion surrounding his motives with regard to the prison deal back in 1798. Perhaps even clearing any suspicion that lingered over the arrest of Lord Edward. But it's also possible that Nielsen's um, return to Ireland was uh, linked in some way to the possibility of a renewed campaign for national independence, centred on Robert Emmett and co-conspirators in Ireland and England. Nielsen left Ireland in late October 1802. In New York and Philadelphia, he met up with some of his old United Irish associates, but ill health would bring his life to an end at the age of 40 in 1803. He would be interred on three occasions. The final one being at the rural cemetery at Poughkeepsie in a ceremony in 1880 that was attended by one of his own daughters, 95-year-old Jane. A new monument, organised and partly paid for by the indefatigable Belfast antiquarian Francis Joseph Bigger, was unveiled in 1905. Samuel Nielsen, in conclusion, was not a military man. 
uh, but he was at the centre of a conspiracy that was militant and which was defeated by a combination of professional soldiers, irregulars and armed loyalists, aided by the understandably amateurish performance of those who turned out in rebellion in 1798. Nielsen's radical outlook, personal experience and circumstance combined to push him and his co-conspirators in the direction of insurgency, and the outcome was catastrophic, with estimates of between 20 and 30,000 deaths during that momentous summer. In the eyes of Theobald Wolfe Tome, Nielsen was the Jacobin, the man to whom Tome doffed his cap on his visits north to the town of Belfast. His editor, editorship of the Northern Star, itself sufficient to merit biographical treatment, was a quite remarkable accomplishment, bringing his readers news of events at home and abroad while politicising large sections of the population. As an organiser of the Republican cause in Ulster and planner of the rebellion in Dublin, Nielsen's contribution deserves to be acknowledged. His legacy is difficult to gauge. Certainly the liberal Presbyterian position lingered longer in Ulster than many would care to admit, while the eclipsing of his inclusive form of political radicalism by a more narrow and sectional position made the development of Irish nationalism in the 19th century something that Nielsen, with his Presbyterian orthodoxy, would have found difficulty perhaps in supporting. Despite the idealism, the sectarian toxicity of 1798 offered a grim preview of the future. There will be some dispute about Nielsen's true legacy. The campaign for a, pre for a free press and the cause of liberty sits uncomfortably with his suspicion of Catholics and disdain for the hierarchy of that church. In many senses, we are still dealing with Nielsen's contradictions today, but that is not to dilute the true importance of this forgotten patriot. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. That was, that was good. Um, we've got time for a couple of questions. Uh, Anyone want to start? Yes. What about the life of Theodore and George in 1791? How did that impact the theory of Belfast in that? Yeah, I think as far as Belfast was concerned, uh, the fact that it was an overwhelming, overwhelmingly Presbyterian town uh, meant that, that Presbyterians there could afford to be as radical politically as they were. Um, there were crucibles of uh, sectarian rivalry, particularly in places like County Armagh, where the, the numbers uh, and the demographics uh, made it likely that Presbyterians would be less receptive to the radical ideas that would see them embrace um, you know the the Catholics, the defenders, and, and tradition uh, in that area. Uh, there had been um, conflict, there had been fights, there had been organised riots, um, sort of pre-Facebook organised riots. I'm sure back in the uh, 1790s, uh, attacks, raids for arms, uh, the Break of Day boys, uh, the, the defenders engaged in sectarian conflict. And of course that came to a head uh, with the formation of the Orange Order after the Battle of the Diamond uh, in September of 1795. So I think into that cocktail of exciting political radicalism that you see in Ireland at that particular time, you know, secret societies like Defenderism, like the, Orange, uh, like the United Irishmen, you then have, um, you then have the Orange Order. Uh, and I think it certainly played a very, very significant role in undermining the prospects of a successful rebellion, particularly in Ulster. Um, as the 1790s developed, um, the government, which had initially been suspicious of what was effectively a, a lower class armed Protestant gang, uh, then began to see the potential uh, of, of Orangeism uh, as a, as a counter-revolutionary strategy. Uh, and so when the Yeomanry companies were established after 1796, many Orangemen enlisted and enrolled en masse uh, in yeoman companies and, and, and orange lodges um, became yeoman you know to a man so i think you know the rise of orangeism adds a further complication uh, to the narrative uh, and helps to undermine the the prospects for for success for the united irishman and for presbyterians uh, particularly in places like south down and armagh their loyalties would be tested and that was something that could be seen as early as 1792 when Nielsen and Wolf Tone had to go to Rathryland uh, in County Down 
um, to mediate uh, in disputes between Presbyterians, Presbyterian volunteers, and local Catholics. Um, and even then, you know, when, pres when Presbyterians within volunteer companies were suggesting an enthusiasm for political reform, there was that sort of innate um, suspicion that always had threatened to undermine the uh, undermine the project. Was the conflict due to the rise of the linen industry and rivalry? It, it was partly uh, religious and doctrinal. Um, it was partly to do with turf and land, uh, and it was also partly to do with um, you know with with local industry uh, in that part of the linen triangle. Um, there were a number of um, Catholic weavers and workers. Um, who were accepting of lower wages, um, who were taking what were seen to be, you know, Protestant jobs, and there were also a number of uh, wealthy Catholic businessmen uh, in, you know, County Down and parts of Armagh as well. Bernard Coyle, uh, for example, um, a successful Muslim uh, uh, cambric uh, manufacturer, uh, who had his um, his his plant in Lurgan, was employing as many as five hundred people. Um, so, you know, there was this. Um, economic element um, to the conflict, yeah. Um, I'm just interested if maybe you could talk a bit more about Nason's motivations for joining uh, United Irish Society and he was suspicious of Catholics, disliked the ascendancy. Was it social justice and Catholic emancipation that he was supporting? To what extent was it Irish nationalism? Just more about, you know, what he believed that he was um, supporting what his motivations were, yeah. and also to what extent did his uh, family agree with him? Did his brothers join the society, or what were his father's views? He was wondering if within his family context where he stood. Okay. Um, I'll deal with the family bit first. Um, Nathan's father died in 1793, and, and so there's, there's very little um, evidence that exists uh, as far as you know his father's. Um, Political ambitions um, are concerned. Uh, he was in the running, um, you know, to become the um, Andrew will help me here. The moderator. moderator thank you, uh, in the synod, um, uh, but was defeated uh, in that. Um, uh, Nielsen's mother lived to a ripe old age, and, and she was uh, still living in Belfast when when Nielsen snuck back uh, in eighteen o three to to meet with his family. Um, his um, his brothers, um, John was a leading volunteer, uh, and when he died in 1787, uh, there was a, a volunteer escort, um, you know, to his interment at Knockbreda um, Parish Church, just opposite what's now Forest Side uh, in Belfast. Thomas Nielsen was known as a, a significant radical player, and that was one of Samuel's other brothers, and. Um, Thomas Nielsen is identified as a member of the the Irish Jacobins, uh, which was what Nancy Curtin calls a, a stalking horse almost for the United Irishman, uh, probably representative of, of more lower class um, United Irishmen in Belfast at the time. Um, Thomas Nielsen's name appears, I think, second on the list uh, in a scrap of paper that can be found in the, uh, the Pratt papers, the Camden papers in Maidstone in Kent. Um, he had another brother who was in Belfast, and he was Alexander, who was a druggist. Uh, and while very little is known about his political involvement, because he died at the early part of the 1790s, um, I, 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 I'm suggesting um, that uh, Nielsen's knowledge of uh, things like saltpeter um, would have been useful for him in terms of arming the United Irishman, um, uh, you know, and, and providing for the manufacture of gunpowder uh, during the 1790s. The first part of the question then was about his motivations. Uh, I think a critical part of that is um, Nielsen's sense of social injustice, um, that he, um, who was eligible to vote in the county elections in Down, and because he owned land in Skegganil in, in the north um, of Belfast, was eligible to vote in the elections for County Antrim, was unable to vote um, in the... Um, uh, in, in, in parliamentary elections for Belfast, uh, because Belfast was so tightly controlled by uh, the Marquis of Donegal. So I think there's a big sense of injustice there that uh, people who are contributing greatly to the increasing wealth of this sort of prosperous town 
were being deprived of any form of political representation. And this all coincides with the, the new language of representation and liberty and justice that was coming out of uh, the American colonies uh, at this particular time. So I think that's the early stage of his motivation. And I think as the 1790s progress, Nielsen's motivation becomes um, much more obvious in the sense that he faces persecution. Um, the volunteers face persecution. The Northern Star is dragged to Dublin on two occasions, and Nielsen complains bitterly that he is, um, you know, he's been taken away from his business interests. He's been taken away from his um, his his bread and butter, uh, and uh, the fact that government persecution of the Star had effectively bankrupted Nielsen by the middle part of the 1790s, I think, is a big part of his political motivation as well. And then there's coincidence of all of these things, um, you know, the French Revolution, um, his, uh, his enthusiasm for Tone's idea, and it is within Tone's argument on behalf of the Catholics in Ireland that you have this notion of, you know, almost like lapsed Catholics um, showing their enthusiasm for political change and for the local innovation. All of these things, I think, coincide uh, and push Nielsen to the brink. Intrigued by your comment about uh, McCracken and his involvement in assassinations, I wonder could you say a little bit more about? Okay. Um, well, I'm I'm not going to say that Nielsen tr uh, pulled. Oh, sorry, that McCracken pulled the trigger. Um, uh, what I can say is that there is evidence both in um, the public records office here in Northern Ireland, but also in the rebellion papers in Dublin. Uh, that McCracken was involved in um, a campaign basically to remove anybody who might implicate himself and other senior United Irishmen uh, that, that might get to the courts. So there are a number of um, government informers um, who are, in a sense, um, removed. Um, some of this happens before McCracken himself is arrested and brought to Kilmainham in October 1797. Some of it happens uh, after. Um, so I suppose a number of people, uh, there's a guy called John Kingsbury, uh, who uh, is a butcher uh, in North Street, uh, who is a well-known loyalist uh, and who was um, heard singing loyalist songs in a pub uh, in Belfast. And he's followed uh, on his way home along the Lagan towpath and is done to death. Uh, there's an attempt on the life of Sergeant John Lee, who is a sergeant of invalids at Carrick Fergus. Um, and um, uh, there is also an assassination attempt on the Reverend Philip Johnson, who's the Anglican minister at Derryake, um, close to Lisburn. Um, there is also the murder of uh, an officer in the Limerick um, City Militia, uh, who's called Joseph Connolly, or Joseph Connell. And um, he was turfed into the River Lagan uh, over one of the bridges, uh, I think it was the Long Bridge, um, and his body recovered. Now, the specific evidence which implicates McCracken in this, um, the, um, the Reverend George Lambert in uh, Eden Derry uh, in County Offaly um, is saying that um, two deserters from Connell's regiment had been arrested and in their possession were papers uh, that were signed H. J. McSee. Um, there's evidence coming out of the prisons in Dublin from United Irish uh, detainees writing secretly to Henry Joy McCracken saying, you need to get out. There are two people from the Limerick City Militia who have been arrested and they are prepared to swear and to stand up in court and implicate you. So it, it's, a, it's a fairly complicated mix, but there are about seven or eight sources, all of which seem to be suggesting from very, very different people that McCracken and other senior United Irish figures like Thomas Richardson in Belfast have something to hide. And then in the McCracken papers in Pruny, um, when um, McCracken is writing to and fro uh, to Mary Ann uh, in Belfast, uh, Mary Ann um, makes reference to that item that you referred to that could become dangerous has now been buried in the countryside and nobody will be able to implicate you. And you know, putting all of those together uh, is suggestive that McCracken was in some way involved. He was um, part of the Muddler Society or the Muddlers Club uh, in Belfast, uh, along with uh, Thomas Russell and people like Thomas Potts. There's a, there's a, 
There's a class of United Irishmen that are very, very um, s sparingly referred to in, in a lot of the published books. People like Thomas Potts and people like uh, William McCracken, Henry John McCracken's brother, uh, Francis McCracken, um, uh, people like Thomas Story, um, who, Rowley Osborne, it's a classic case, you know, Joseph Cuthbert, you know, they're all very significant players in the Belfast United Irishman, but they're not in that upper echelon. And they were plotting the assassination of Sergeant Lee um, from Carrick Fergus. And McCracken is there whenever a party leaves um, the, uh, the famous pub in Sugar House Entry uh, and make their way to, to attempt the assassination of Lee. Uh, they return having injured the sergeant, he's not dead, and um, McCracken is part of the party that returns uh, and they, they carry home Sergeant Lee's overcoat as a sort of trophy of war. So uh, it's a pretty complicated picture, uh, but I think the evidence is there uh, and the evidence can be stacked up to suggest that McCracken, who may not have been actively involved in pulling the trigger, was certainly central to a range of political assassinations. There was no assassination committee, uh, but I think people got together uh, to eliminate potential threats to the United Irish societies in Belfast at that particular time. Yeah, I wanted to ask about Nielsen's progression from uh, sort of advanced radical to revolution of opponent of our insurrection. And as you know, this is a really complicated issue because our evidence is so fragmented. Now, Louis Cullen years ago pointed out this whole notion that the United Irish men are only forced into the path of revolution when they're suppressed by the government. It, it originates with the, the statement made by the state prisoners, which, of course, Nielsen, as you showed, is very much involved in. And what they're doing there, after the bloodshed in 1798, is saying, this isn't our fault. It's the government who draws the desperate courses. And Nancy Curtin did bring forward some fragmentary evidence that, as early as 1793, the anti mm -hmm. Irishmen are already drilling and so on. Yeah. But you seem to go you know, from a more conventional view that it's only after 1795 mm -hmm. that the United Irishmen, no, uh, uh, that they're trying to arm insurrection. So I was wondering, have you got direct evidence from Nielsen's career that Allowed to throw more light on this. Yeah, there's some, uh, and um, <laughs> certainly for the purpose of the talk, I can understand that's the, in a sense, the traditional view. Uh, I'm, I'm putting out some evidence there to suggest that, in fact, you know, th there was something uh, going on from earlier times. And I think when uh, when when Nielsen, O'Connor, Emmett, and McNevin were were putting together their their statements uh, as part of the Kilmainham Pact in 1798. They were they were sugarcoating the process, and they were saying that they were pushed into it by the actions of a of a provocative government. Um, I think we can see with the disappearance of the crown from the masthead of the Northern Star uh, in early 1793 that you know there is a a move towards a more republican uh, outlook. Um, the United Irishmen in Lisbon, um, uh, in, I think as early as 1792. Uh, were writing to the, uh, the the leading United Irishmen in Dublin, um, you know people like Oliver Bond, um, uh, people um, like Drennan, saying um, we would like to have an arms committee or an armed committee. We would like permission to purchase weapons, and of course, you know, the, the more um, respectable uh, Dublin United Irishmen are sort of poo-pooing this and saying, no, no, I don't really think this is necessary. At that stage, the volunteers were still. You know, armed in a sense, and so there was no contemplation of the United Irishmen becoming an armed society. Um, and there are very strong links between the United Irishmen and the Defenders long before you know the suppression of the United Irishmen. And I think Cullen's article was really, really an interesting one. He was debunking this idea that there was the the, the, the constitutional period followed by the revolutionary period. And I think I think there is evidence to suggest that that was the case. The acceleration of the um, the more republican strategy, in a sense, I suppose, comes with the disappointments that emerge out of the recall of Fitzwilliam. And again, more modern historiography is suggesting that that's, you know, much more complicated than was originally contemplated. Uh, and also the fact that you know tone had gone to France. Uh, um, I think there's a sense amongst the United Irishmen in Belfast that that tone's doing his bit. We need now to up our game uh, in Belfast and elsewhere. Uh, and, and I think there is a, a genuine acceleration in terms of arms manufacture, in terms of moves to, to, to unite the United Irishmen in Belfast, Antrim and Down, 
with the Catholic defenders. And you know, it is at that stage that the very fragmentary aspect of uh, evidence emanating from uh, defender circles starts to come into being, uh, because people like Nielsen and McCracken are basically perambulating across the province and are meeting with defender lodges, are giving money to defend people like Bernard Coyle, who's arrested in 1795. And um, there is a genuine, uh, a genuine move, I think, to, uh, to affect a coalition. So I think uh, it's actually, in my view, a little bit of both. There is an acceleration once Tone embarks upon his strategy in France, but there is evidence to suggest that some quite enthusiastic United Irishmen in Ulster are actually moving towards a Republican position much earlier than that. I won't ask a question. It's, it's very difficult to write the biography of an archive. Um, it is. And um, I, I suppose a lot of what you're getting from Nielsen is through the pages of the Northern Star. And I was just wondering, uh, during your research, you've, you've collected a lot of wonderful material from all, all sorts of um, repositories. But as an editor, do you have any sense of what his day-to-day -day job was as an editor? Where is he getting stories from? Um, is he writing on the editorials himself? Um, um, and how big an impact does he have on the Northern Star? Is he one amongst many, or is he the principal person? Um, he's one of a committee, um, which is put together, you know, and the origins of the Northern Star predate um, the establishment of the Society of the United Irishmen. Um, you know, it's first printed in January of 1792. Something like that doesn't happen overnight, and I think there's a, there's a long period of gestation. Um, Nielsen, William Tennant, um, John Tisdall, who then retreats from the movement, who had experience in the Belfast Mercury, which I think is a, uh, is a, is a newspaper from the 1780s that people know very, very little about, but the extant copies of the Mercury show that it is quite an advanced paper in its own right. Um, so you've got uh, Henry Hazlitt and John Hazlitt. You know, there is a committee of people, Thomas Russell, who are all very much um, to the fore as far as the Northern Star is concerned. Um, there is a beginning of a retreat in mid-1792 when a lot of the people who were early shareholders begin to walk away because I think they see the writing on the wall in terms of this is not a profit-making enterprise. And I think a lot of these Belfast merchants were all about profit. Uh, and Nielsen effectively is left there, um, you know, not alone, but, um, you know, writing editorials that were uh, politically dynamic uh, and in the context of the time, quite radical. But he's also quite circumspect, you know, because Nielsen is, is trying to avoid uh, arrest. He's also trying to avoid persecution. And there are occasions whenever in his editorials, he's actually telling people to sort of tone down. Um, you know, he criticizes for example, the planting of liberty trees in, in County Armagh. So he, he's been cautious. Um, and I think part of that is, um, you know, to avoid the dangers of, of arrest and imprisonment. But part of it is also to, um, you know, to allow these things to happen, but to, to give ostensible opposition to it at the same time. So there's an element of caution but I'm not sure that actually applies to what Nielsen is doing outside of the press room. Um, did he write the editorials? Um, yes. Uh, Madden's critical of the Northern Star, you know, because he feels it's just like any other newspaper. And of course it is, you know, it's, it's, it's using the packets, it, it's, it's reproducing Dublin news, uh, it's reproducing news coming in from, uh, from the banks of the Delaware. Um, he is, um, he is, producing the types of things that other newspapers are doing. And in fact, when the star was being persecuted in 1794, you know, Nielsen and um, other shareholders in the Northern Star were sent to Dublin uh, for publishing something that had actually appeared in the Belfast newsletter as well. And so the star has been persecuted, and yet the newsletter isn't. Um, after 1794, the newsletter was. Uh, Joy had sold uh, the newsletter. Uh, it had been purchased by Robert Allen, uh, a Scotsman, and was becoming increasingly uh, a sort of mouthpiece of, of government policy. Uh, and so, you know, there's a, the war, in a sense, between the Northern Star and the newsletter, where, where paper boys are being attacked and newspapers have been thrown in the rivers and so on uh, to stop the circulation. And that's on both sides. Um, so I think there's a, there's a caution, I think, Andrew, as far as some of Nielsen's editorials are concerned, uh, because if he was to push too hard, then the project would be in jeopardy. 
Uh, and I suppose one of the ironies is after Nielsen's arrest in 1796, the editorials become much more strident. Uh, and, and two of the, the leading Belfast United Irishmen who are not yet in prison, and that's William and Robert Sims, um, are, are doing the editorial duties. And you can see a real stoking up of the, the language uh, in, in the Northern Star, uh, reporting atrocities carried out by, uh, by orange men uh, from different parts. Uh, and a lot of these reports are being carried by emissaries, um, you know, who are, who are out and about in Ulster at that particular time. You know, uh, the guys perhaps of selling linen, uh, you're also communicating political ideas. Um, you've got people like Nielsen's nephew, John Gordon, uh, who is going along as a guest speaker with Freemason events across uh, Ulster. And, um, you know, he's coming back and reporting news, I suspect, of, well, you want to hear what's happening out in Tyrone. Uh, so I think they're, they're getting their stories uh, from traditional sources, but they're also getting their stories um, from, from local sources uh, being carried back to Belfast by emissaries. Nielsen's not reporting uh, atrocities committed by um, supporters of the radicals or by um, Catholic defenders. Um, the newsletter is. Uh, and so you've got the Northern Star in 1796 and 97 reporting the atrocities carried out by the Orangemen, and you've got the newsletter um, reporting atrocities being carried out uh, by, uh, by, by the Republican um, factions, if you like. But it's, I mean, the whole Northern Star editorial um, structure, I think, it is, is, is really quite fascinating. And it is the only very obvious repository um, as far as Nielsen is concerned. Everything else, you know, I describe it sometimes as it's like a, a 100,000 piece jigsaw without the picture to go on. You know, it's like that. So 10 years seems like an awfully long time. Uh, but, you know, Peter did refer to, you know, my, my other job. Uh, and it, it, it's a long and painstaking task. Um, yeah, it's a breeze. It's a breeze. <laughs> 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 you bumped. Uh, may I ask just not, uh, another question, and that's an, <laughs> an obvious question for me. Um, you refer to Nielsen as a Presbyterian, and um, I just wonder is Presbyterianism an important element here as well in terms of the structures and networks and people that he knows? Because his minister in the third congregation, mm. Sinclair Kelber, mm. um, who's a noted uh, radical, uh, James Porter publishes, you know, uh, Bluff and Squire, mm. Squire Firebrand uh, in the newspaper. I just wonder, uh, are those religious networks being used, those denominational networks being used by, by Nielsen um, at the same time to try and bring in extra material? I think so. Um, you know that there is a there is an essentially democratic nature um, amongst Presbyterianism at that time, and it's a remarkable just how many sons of the manse are 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 leading figures within the United Irish movement, um, and how many Presbyterian ministers contribute to you know the development of of political ideas at a local level. So you've got people like Steele Dixon and Porter Ferry, you've got Birch in Saint Field, uh, you've got Porter in Grey Abbey, you've got Warwick. You've got licentiates like David Bailey Warden uh, in the yards, uh, and I think they are all contributing uh, significantly. Porters um, uh, going around Ulster delivering lectures on on science, um, and I suspect that that's only part of it. Uh, I, I think you know part of the sermonising is much more political uh, than that. So I think yeah, that there is, um, and you know, ironically. Of the three congregations in in Rosemary Street in Belfast, you know, two of them are, are new light, uh, and you know, uh, the minister in first is William Bruce, who is the epitome of that cautious, um, you know, l less democratically inclined Presbyterian. The minister in second congregation is Patrick Vance, and actually the the the, the most radical congregation in in Rosemary Street is is third, which is a, an Orthodox church in Kelburn is arrested actually uh, in 1796 on the evidence of um, uh, of an informer in Lisburn uh, alongside Alexander Crawford and I don't think either of them were directly implicated um, but uh, Edward John Newell you know he got he got quite a lot of his people right in terms of who was arrested but he also got some wrong and I think Kelburn you know is I, I certainly suspect an apologist for the United Irishman, but I don't see any evidence that he was a United Irishman as such. Uh, but I think that, that the Rosemary Street 
sort of dynamic is quite an interesting one because it sort of bucks the trend uh, that all new light um, Presbyterians were much more inclined towards the United Irish than, than, than others. Uh, it, it's a it's a, a sort of brand of um, theology within Presbyterianism which is uh, less inclined to um, to be obsessed with original sin uh, and with the basic um, badness, I suppose, of man. Uh, it's also um, uh, not adhering to the Westminster Confession of Faith, so it is essentially non-subscribing. That's a a very short answer to, I'm sure, a much more difficult question, Andrew, uh, which you'll mention, which you'll mention to me later, I'm sure. Ken, can, can I ask you um, another question about um, Nielsen's Presbyterianism? And that is, how does he deal with the, radical, the religious radicalization of the French Revolution as the Jacobin regime moves beyond anti-Catholicism into anti-Christianity, as Tom Paine moves beyond you know, the rights of man into, into the, the age of reason, yeah. a much more radical anti-Christian I mean, how does that affect, if you like, this kind of, kind of Presbyterian certainty? I, th I think he has a major problem with it. Um, and, I mean, you know, reading The Age of Reason, it's staggering sometimes, the, you know, the, um, the anti-clerical aspect, the anti-clerical nature of it. Um, Nielsen is a good Presbyterian. Um, he's not... Um, He's not like um, Thomas Russell and others, including Porter, you know, who are uh, pushing millennialist theories uh, at this particular time and, and seeing the French Revolution as the, the harbinger of, um, you know, of biblical change, as it were. Um, but um, there's a real strong sense in Nielsen's letters um, from Fort George to his wife Anne back in Belfast of, of providence guiding and as the French Revolution becomes more deistic and as the French Revolution becomes um, something that I think many Ulster Presbyterians would have had difficulty with, uh, Nielsen and others are beginning to question um, whether the French thing uh, is actually a positive or not. And certainly by the end of the decade, uh, with the emergence of Bonaparte, uh, there is a genuine fear, and you can see this from the writings of Thomas Russell um, from prison and also from Nielsen, that... Yeah, that, that Burke, Burke had predicted this, you know, Burke had said that an, a military junta is almost the inevitable consequence uh, of um, what was happening in, in 1789, and um, I think Russell and Nielsen were, were very wary. Uh, of this, uh, and they saw um, the danger of uh, one colonial master being replaced by another. And you know, if the French had landed in 1798, was there a possibility that um, the French would use Ireland for uh, its own ends and would would subjugate, um, you know, any sort of um, Irish outlook? And the Catholic Church is very anti-French revolution as well. I mean, it was set up in 1790 something as a the Catholic clergy could get educated in France. Yeah, and, and that was also part of the, you know, the carrot and stick uh, policy um, from London. Um, you know, the idea that, that um, you know, this would be a way of keeping Catholics out of the, uh, out of the orbit of, of uh, Irish republicanism. Yeah, but I think, I think Nielsen is certainly uneasy with the direction that the French Revolution takes. Um, and that's not universally shared because, um, you know, in the run-up to 1803, people like Robert Emmett are still, you know, working the French lines and there, there is still a, a sense in which the French can be of service. But I think Nielsen is very uneasy uh, about um, how the French Revolution is developing. 